you. Um, very happy to be here, and we've been hearing a lot about Chinese students studying abroad everywhere. And now let's turn the focus to students actually who study abroad in China and who they are, what they do. Um, so today I'm presenting really one case from a project that I just did, um, just finished in December. So hopefully I will get some interesting, um, useful comments from the audience so that I can keep working on this project. So um, the, the topic today really is is talking, thinking about the, the concept of race. Um, the reason for that is really, um, if, you, if you pay attention to the media, the political discourse in the United States these days, you cannot avoid the, to the topic of race. There is so much racialization of the black and brown populations especially. And um, I will not be focusing on the Asian American students who study abroad in China for various reasons. First of all, we have this um, the study that shows that Asian American, partially due to this you know, model minority narrative, Asian Americans experience has been very, very different from other groups. So for this study, I really am only focusing on the black and brown population. Um, and also, it's also really interesting when we look at study abroad, um, this racialized minorities that are very underrepresented in the study abroad population, at least within the United States, we see that over 40% of college students in the US are minority students, but less than a quarter of them are actually uh, account for the study abroad population. Um, and also, um, there's also this idea, uh, this concept proposed by Nelson Flores and uh, Jonathan Rosa, that the concept of heritage learners is actually a little bit of racist if you think about how uh, minoritized students are assumed to have a home language that they should learn and speak. That's also why I'm not focusing on the Chinese students, uh, Chinese American students who study abroad in China, although that's a very interesting topic in uh, of itself. So, um, so, and looking at the study abroad literature, even though there's not a lot of research on the issue of race, there has been some, very, very little. Um, there has been a lot of work on issues about identity, especially about gender. Um, gender is always really problematic for study abroad students. Um, and uh, in recent research, including my previous work, we're seeing this shift from just focusing this you know, a priori kind of identity, social identity categories to really looking at the social, the linguistic processes, the discursive processes of how identity is constructed and performed. Um, and if we look at the research on race, uh, we are seeing a little bit of research. We're seeing this issue of blackness. Um, um, what, do, what does it mean for, for black students to study abroad um, in um, Spain and Brazil? And we're also seeing some of, at this conference, we're seeing some research about students in China. Um, and we're also seeing this very interesting concept. Um, this is a project in, uh, in sociology that was based on 550 Chinese respondents and 250 African um, immigrants, merchants in China, and this concept that the Chinese society, I'm not saying the Chinese society is not racist or does not have the concept of race, it's that they have not yet formed a collective xenophobic conscious, meaning that um, there's not this idea of, of threat that is associated with the black and brown population. They are not seen as violent or dangerous or, or, threat, or threatening to the society. That is the characteristic of, of the racialization processes here in the United States. So, I guess what I'm getting from this kind of uh, background is that what does it mean for these racialized black and brown students when they study abroad in the society that is very different, that has a very different perspective about race? What does it mean for them to learn the language and to study abroad in China? So I draw from these theoretical positions that, first of all, identity is always emergent and relational. It's emergent from interactions from everyday life and identity is always recontextualized in day-to-day -day interaction that what it means is that identity doesn't always mean the same thing. Um, it can mean new, thi new things in different contexts. And also um, this idea that racialization, this identity race is always constructed through language and discourse. Um, so my research questions, more like my guiding questions for this project is that how do um, racialized uh, black and brown students experience the concept of race when they study abroad in China, and how do they construct and negotiate their racial or racialized identity through language, through Mandarin in this case, in everyday interaction. So I, in order to answer these questions, I took a case study approach, um, 
And the reason for that is that, yes, case study is very difficult to produce uh, generalizable findings, but that's not the point here. The point here is instead of thinking of statistical, uh, statistical significance, we need to think about the societal significance. And in order to achieve that, we have to do the what we call the purposeful sampling, that I'm not looking at random samples. I'm looking at very interesting cases, and in this case, racialized minority students. So the project that I conducted had um, 21 American students, all at intermediate advanced levels. Um, and they were all placed with either a Chinese roommate or a host family. And they study abroad in, um, 11 of them study abroad in, the in, in an intensive summer program, and 10 of them study abroad um, in the fall, uh, in a fall semester in last year. So in terms of their racial background, and I'm using sort of the US-based, skin-based way of looking at race. So, um, about half of the students were white, and, um, and we have about a quarter of students who were Asian. Most of, the, most of them were Chinese Americans, and um, also we have about 20%, 19% that were mi mixed. Um, we only had, um, I only had one black student and one brown student. Um, I'm going to only present the data from that um, he self-identified as brown um, here. And uh, do you ask me questions about the black student if uh, you have questions about that other yeah, case? About brown student race, is this a new race? He self, well, I think in the US it's not uncommon to have this concept. And I will present your da the data to show what it means to be brown in the US. So these are the, the, the uh, data sources. Um, which is a lot. <laughs> um, so I conducted interviews with each of the students. Um, the interviews were conducted in the language of their preference. Um, I conducted interviews with each of their Chinese hosts, um, the Chinese roommates and Chinese home, uh, families. Um, and I gave the students audio recorders so that they were asked to record their day-to-day -day conversations with their, either their roommates or host families. Um, they, they were also uh, asked to do the background surveys at the beginning and also the linguistic questionnaires at the beginning and the, the, uh, the, the end of the program. I also did site visits and I tried to do participant observation. Um, I also did uh, collected their social media information, um, which is the WeChat, because Facebook was not accessible from China. A lot of students had WeChat, so I looked at what they posted. Um, so the focal case I'm going to present here today, the pseudonym is different from the abstract that you see in the program, do you also ask me the question why? Um, and so he was Shahid uh, pseudonym. Um, he was a 20 year old uh, self identified Pakistani American. He was born and raised in the US. Um, and he, was, he came from an upper middle class uh, Muslim family in uh, upstate New York. And he intentionally chose the, the last name, the Chinese family Ma, which is associated with Chinese Muslims. Um, and um, and uh, he also grew up in a predominantly white town in New York. Um, he reported being bullied in high school because of his skin color. And um, his history of learning Chinese is very interesting. He was, um, his parents were both uh, doctors and his primary caretaker during childhood was an immigrant uh, Chinese maid um, from Sichuan, China. And so he learned Chinese from interacting with that maid um, from his, from being born and all the way till uh, 11 years old. And that was also when, um, right before the Sichuan earthquake, which is, which is also, which became important later on. So um, he actually never formally studied Chinese until college. Um, but, uh, but then he also studied abroad in the summer of 2016 in an intensive language program. And he would always self, he would often self identify, well, I had this Ai, this maid uh, who raised me, so I'm, I'm Hua Cha, I'm Chinese American. I'm not a regular American, so it's really interesting. And he was, he actually decided to officially transfer to the Chinese university, and he just went back to China yesterday to do the second semester. He's getting a degree in the Chinese university right now. So, um, very interesting case. Um, so, um, the analysis that I did is, um, so first of all, I used the social, uh, the qualitative research tool um, called the DOES to uh, do thematic coding. And then I also did this course analysis based on 100, 160 minutes of audio recordings from, from, uh, 
from him. And as for the discourse analysis, I specifically looked at how identity emerged and how it was contextualized. So um, let's look at the findings. So there was this important theme in his um, narrative data in his interviews, this idea of being a foreigner everywhere. So um, he was in the, in the United States, they see I'm brown. And if I go to Arizona, and partially because I am, I work in Arizona, and also he does go to, he does visit Arizona every summer. He says, they probably think I'm Mexican, which is also probably true. Um, and so I'm foreigner there. And, um, but I don't know much about Pakistan. I was, I was not born there. And my parents did not want to tell me anything about Pakistan. And I think the culture is a little bit radical. There's a lot of terrorism. So this idea that, well, I can't fit in in Pakistan because it's, ra it's, it's terrorist, but I can't fit in in America because it's racist. And this idea of if I become assimilated into the white dominant American society, then I'm whitewashed, this concept of whitewashed. So uh, for, and the, uh, Pakistan, a friend calls me whitewashed. Like the rest of the kids in my high school, I get angry because I think they're more whitewashed than I am. So there are a couple of re really interesting things here that whiteness is not the color of the skin. It's an adjective. And being whitewashed is a metaphor that your, your colored body is stripped of its color and you're losing your identity. You're losing the, the nature of your body. And, and it's also interesting that it's something that to be angry about. It's losing that essence of who you are. So, so what we can see here is this sort of problem tension here. So America is seen as racist and in order to assimilate, um, that is whitewashed, and then Pakistan is terrorist, and then it's brown, it indexes this you know, radical culture. So where does China fit in? Well, I'm a foreigner everywhere, but in China, it's cool to be a foreigner. <laughs> so when they see a foreigner in China, they think you are really cool. But in America, if you're a foreigner, it's not cool. Um, and um, this is something to do, uh, this has something to do with the sociological nature of Chinese society right now because of China's embracing of globalization. There is this, this welcoming of, of diversity, even though it's not unproblematic. Uh, we'll talk more about this later if you have any questions. Um, but this is also, there's also this idea of if you are a foreigner in America, even if your English is 90% good, they only hear the 10% bad. But in China, if you say your Chinese is, they would say, oh my god, your Chinese is 90% good. So the expectations are different. So they, the Chinese people are better, they are more accepting. So, so China comes in as a place where he can see, well, I'm a foreigner, but at least I'm accepted in the society. And another important theme in his narrative data is this idea of fear, that he lived in a lot of fear as a racialized brown person in a dominant white town in, in, the, state, in the United States. And this idea of, in China, there's no crime. And also he, has, he, he said, I don't have to live in fear here. There's no crime. And this is Shanghai. This is a city of 24 million. Obviously, it's not true that there's no crime. <laughs> but what he's saying is that I'm not afraid of going to banks in the night. And um, my friends in the US were raped, were assaulted. Um, and he talks about the gun violence in the US, whereas in, the, in China, which is also true uh, because guns are not legal in China. Um, and so, I think most other places. Um, and, and he says that I feel safe here, there's no crime. This is something that I'm seeing in other students' narratives too, that the, the concept of safety, especially for racialized minorities. Um, and I think that is something that a lot of us who are not racialized in the same ways do not get the chance to experience. Um, so what we're seeing is from all these themes is that, so we already see this, this sort of tension, but China comes in as an alternative, as a second dimension for his race, racial identity, that China is also not white, and, but there's not also, it's not violent against racialized uh, brown people. Um, so what does this mean for his language use? How does he construct and negotiate race in his language? It's really interesting that he uses a linguistic feature that is almost obsolete these days in Chinese, in Mandarin. This, 
this word Gui Zi came up a lot. So it really is a uh, literally means devils, but often associated with foreign devils. Um, it emerged from a time of when China was colonized, um, and the foreign devils were associated with, um, you can say Japanese devils or white devils, they are associated with, um, thank you, they are associated with uh, colonists. And what he's doing is recontextualizing the term. And in order to show you how he's recontextualizing, uh, let me first show you how it's getting obsolete in Chinese. So this is from Google Ngram data. Um, so as you can see, this is from the year of 1840 when the Opium War happened and then till 2008. So you can see this term is really not getting very popular these days. It was very popular during Mao's time. Um, and it's really interesting is that if you see, okay, well, it's still being used, but it's really being used to refer to the Japanese. And because there's a lot of strong nationalistic sentiment in China, especially against the Japanese people, whereas the white devils is really becoming very, very dated. No, very, very few instances. But in, in uh, Shahid's recordings, we see um, 10 instances of this word being used in only 160 minutes of data. And all, none of them was referring to Japanese. All of them were referring to whites. And let's, uh, let's look at how he actually uses it. I'm going to play the recording for those of you who, does, who do stand, understand Chinese so that you can also hear his accent, which is. You might need to, you might need to don't want to. That's a, okay, no, no. That's a, that, that, that's a, you know, you know, that's a, you know, 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 you yeah, I saw people who understand Chinese were laughing because uh, it's such a strange term these days, right? Um, so what, what's happening is that he was very anxious about being seen as arrogant um, coming from the US. So he was asking his Chinese roommate, am I being arrogant when I say, oh, America, you don't know what America is. America has problems. And, 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 and by, by which he means America has a racist pro race problem that black people are being killed, the police brutality. Um, and what's going on here, as you can see, well, I have to explain to you what's going on. And, um, and also then, what about I don't like British people? Um, and my, my dad went to a British devil school um, here. So this is where it happens. So what's happening here is that, remember the concept of whitewashed? Um, it's not a concept that can be easily translated into Chinese, but by using this also almost obsolete term in Chinese, he's trying to say, he's trying to recontextualize this term by saying, well, my dad, his concept is, is being, being imposed by these British, British devils. So using a term that was already racially um, charged, he's sort of positioning himself with those Chinese people who were suffering from colonialism and saying, I'm anti-colonialism, I'm anti-racism. And so another instance in which, um, so here, actually, let me show you the other example first. Well, actually, so he's using this, this Chinese word to sort of towards or against this idea of racism here. And um, another instance, I'm not going to play the order audio this time. So he actually got into a fight with a, with a British uh, white person at a, at a restroom. And, um, and what's happening here is that his roommate felt that there was no reason he should not use violence. So his roommate was very, very, very shocked. So you just started to fight. You were waiting for the bathroom. And then, and then he was like, oh, but he's British. And, and, then, and then his roommate was like, how do you know he's British? I, can, I heard his accent. And so you can also see that the roommate was like still shocked and trying to say, well, this is not right. So you just hurt him? You just hurt him? So that kind of repetitive questions of being shocked. And, and you see how 
Shahi was justifying his choice, which is violence, um, by using this term again. Well, I don't like white British devils, uh, and so once again, we can see you, he was using this term here, recontextualizing it to construct a stance that could justify his moral choice. Involving this violence then becomes moralized using this, this historical term. But it's, always, it's also interesting to see how that historical term is being used in the present and, and becomes recontextualized to contain more meanings. So um, I have to really wrap up. Um, so what we're seeing here is that, um, that we, have, we are seeing in his case that race is a multidimensional concept. That if we look at him, um, or learning, learning language becomes a way to construct this multidimensional racial identity because otherwise he was either he was seeing either terrorist or whitewashed but now because of this study abroad experience and, and language experience he had a second layer of, of racialized identity and speaking Mandarin and use these alternative terms from a different language allows him or to or makes it possible for him to construct a different stance about race about um, anti-racism that would not have been possible um, in, in English. And I think that um, Jamie was talking about uh, in Swahili, there was similar terms um, yesterday. And it was also interesting when we look at a case here, um, and I'm not talking about his individual language gain because it's so complicated. If you look at his, his experience with the language, it's not, it's not something that we would think of when we think about study abroad. Is he studying abroad? Is, he, is this his first experience being immersed in this language? These are all questions that don't fit in this case. And, and these are the study abroad students that we're seeing in an increasing globalized world. So we need to have somewhat of a reconceptualization of study abroad. And it's also really interesting, as you can see, even, even though Shahid is really trying to do anti-racism, He's also racializing people. Uh, <laughs> and also, he was also not able to recognize local forms of, of, of Chinese race, racialization, which is the sort of marginalization of, of, of Chinese Muslims. So th those did not affect him, but it actually affect other people. And I can tell you, um, if you ask me questions, I can tell you later. So anyway, um, these are some of my recommendations that we need to think about um, study abroad and language learning as empowering for these minoritized students. They have other resources, linguistic and social resources, to think of their identity. And there also needs to be more sort of critical awareness of how pedagogically we can guide students, especially these minoritized students, to recognize local forms of racialization and to think of how their own experience affects their conceptualization of race. And really um, drawing from Bonnie Norton's idea of education as social change, we can also think of study abroad and language learning as social change. That's all for my talk today. Thank you. Thank you.